So let's start the lecture again. Once again, we're going to talk about innovation and the scientific method. And uh, this is part of the first uh, half of the course in which we talk about fundamentals and history. Lecture number five, innovation and the scientific method, following last week's lecture, which was about the uh, history of innovation in Korea. As you know, the second part of the course, second half of the course will be about methods and applications. So we're kind of actually moving towards that because the scientific method will be a kind of method for innovation. So people were talking about reality, people were talking about uh, truth and uh, experiment and testing. So there are aspects of science that are uh, close to innovation. It's not the same as innovation. What was also interesting in the discussion, just like in the very first lecture, when I asked, what is innovation? People were like, oh, it's uh, new thinking, uh, creativity, uh, uh, et cetera. It was kind of difficult to define. Science, everybody kind of knows uh, or recognizes it, but it's actually not so easy to define. So we will try to define that in uh, the course. So the question for the discussion, which we had was, what is science? Uh, let's do a quick review of innovation in Korea. Just a few slides. As you recall, we had a, a number of innovation measurements or innovation rankings. Uh, we talk about the, the Bloomberg ranking and the second one we will talk about is the World Economic Forum. In the Bloomberg ranking, which was based on various data sources and a bunch of criteria, uh, Korea came out number one and Samsung was actually an important part of this ranking. And in the World Economic Forum ranking, South Korea was not even in the top 10. So uh, it's very difficult to actually measure innovation. And in the second half of the course, we will discuss how we measure innovation. So you may want to think about uh, on your own, you know, what uh, are methods to uh, measure innovation. We talked about a number of selected innovations in Korean history, including the heated greenhouse, the uh, water gauge, rain gauge, the mechanical water clock, uh, Hangul, of course. I spelled it wrong here, by the way. It's not Hangul, it's Hangul. Uh, anyway, uh, not perfect. Uh, movable type uh, and uh, everyone's favorite, Undo, or underground, underfloor heating. We talked about the culture and the uh, circumstances that led to a lot of innovation during the period of King Sejong. And one of his chief uh, innovators was Jang yong Chil, kind of the Korean Leonardo da Vinci. And we talked about how we created social structures that broke down class barriers, uh, fostered meritocracy, achievement, dissemination of knowledge. Hangul was a part of that. And uh, this was Yang, Jang yong Chil, uh, who in relation to this breaking class barriers was peasant born, went to school, uh, participated and benefited from the meritocracy and did a whole bunch of selected discoveries. But it's interesting, even though it was a very innovative period in Korean history, he was ultimately brought down by others who uh, felt that he was getting too special or too different and that's a big problem with innovation because by definition, you have to be different or special in many societies, not just Korean society, certainly it's human nature to uh, kind of uh, work against people who are too different and not fitting with the social uh, standards. So that's a big challenge and we're gonna talk about some of those social issues later part in the course. So the topic of today's lecture is uh, innovation and the scientific method. So what is science? What is the scientific method? Uh, inductive versus deductive reasoning. We'll give an example of Albert Einstein and we'll talk about science and technology. And we'll give some examples of technology innovation uh, in the real world. So the question was, what is science? So Science is the intellectual and practical activity. So it's an activity encompassing the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical, natural world, which of course includes biology, 
through the last sentence or the last phrase is very important through observation and experiment. So I am actually reading an audio book now during this COVID-19 crisis. The book I'm reading is about Isaac Newton. You probably heard the story that Isaac Newton did some of his discoveries uh, while he was hiding or not hiding or quarantined or uh, uh, social distancing from a, uh, the plague that was affecting London and Cambridge University. And so he was in his farmhouse and uh, he came up with a lot of physics. So I just thought I would read this biography audio book. And uh, what was interesting, he was talking about uh, people around his time, and one of them was Sir Francis Bacon. And you probably heard the phrase, knowledge is power. Some of you might have heard that word, knowledge is power, right? It's kind of a meme. He was the one who invented that phrase. And the, that sounds like a very, you know, good phrase but actually the more important thing is how do you get that knowledge and sir francis bacon said that we have to do experiment we have to test the idea in the real world and that experimental process uh which is the achievement of the knowledge and then from the knowledge you get the power that uh, is the essence of the scientific method so sir francis bacon is considered the father of the scientific method in, in a Western setting. So this is what science is. So what is the scientific method? It is an ongoing process. You make observations. We said observations are very important. Based on the observations, you think of interesting questions. You formulate hypotheses, and we'll talk about hypotheses uh, shortly. We develop testable predictions. We gather data to test the predictions. And in the middle, we use these experiments, the gathering data, to refine, alter, expand, or revise these hypotheses. And then you develop general theories, and based on those theories, make more observations. So this is a circular, incremental process. But the key elements of this are observations and gathering data, in other words, uh, experiments. So what is a scientific hypothesis? A scientific hypothesis is in between a theory and a fact. So a fact is an observation about the world. And based on that observation, you make a hypothesis, which is not verified. Uh, it's kind of a theory uh, in theory. And then this hypothesis must be falsifiable, must be able to be proven false. And uh, if the collection of hypotheses are shown to be not falsified uh, and in large part valid, that leads to a theory. So that's the role of scientific hypothesis. It plays a central role in the scientific method. It makes the link between a fact and uh, a theory. And the hypothesis is fundamentally a creative process uh, in terms of thinking of a explanation and based on the explanation some testable predictions uh, arising from a fact. So what are some examples of a hypothesis? Rita. Let's, let's actually focus on uh, uh, COVID-19. If you were to make a hypothesis related to COVID-19, what would that be? Anything. There, there are original um, reasons why the COVID happened is because of the fact that in the hand and then people in Wuhan eat that. So that is one of the hypotheses I read about the COVID-19. Okay, so hypothesis would be, was it the bats and eating of the bats that uh, uh, made this uh, virus uh, start? Another right. hypothesis, uh, just so I can propose one, is people talk about two meters 
as the social distancing. So your hypothesis could be, do we need to do six meters based on observation that sometimes people cough much longer distance? That might be a hypothesis. I'm not saying it's true, but the hypothesis might be, well, maybe two meters is not enough. Maybe we need six meters. That would be a hypothesis too. So Rita, what would be a, one kind of hypothesis based on COVID-19? The mask. This is me. The mask using a mask to prevent the virus. Oh, masks, right. So does the mask prevent the uh, spread? So that's an interesting mm. hypothesis because when you make a hypothesis, you have to also be very specific. Mm. So does the mask prevent people who are sick from spreading it? Or does the mask prevent people who are not sick from getting it? Uh, so the hypothesis needs to be quite specific. So that's a good answer. Uh, Putri, what do you, what, what is your idea of a hypothesis? So this is not an easy question. Um, um, what about having a sunbed thing for 10 minutes Sunday. in the morning? Like in yes. the sun? Yep. Okay, that's a good hypothesis. Does exposure to the sun uh, help prevent uh, COVID-19? Yeah, someone so, said that. Hypothesis. So uh, we also already had an answer from Niam about the bats. Marius, what's uh, the <laughs> I, uh, uh, My hypothesis uh, could be that uh, if, uh, if animals are uh, exposed to the to this virus like the dogs and cats yeah right. or maybe any any yeah. other animals because i've read an article that that uh, i think it was lions in a in a zoo in america were infected yeah. that's right okay guna one what would be what a hypothesis you would have that you could possibly test uh, maybe about uh uh, can the can the virus be transmitted through food? Food, okay. I, that's a very good point because when I was uh, looking at this situation in the beginning, uh, there were some uh, outbreaks and clusters at conferences and hotels, particularly conferences. Uh, there was a Biogen in uh, Boston. There was one in uh, Singapore at the Hyatt and others, and uh, my hypothesis, which is related to yours, Guna one, is that uh, buffets were a particularly uh, easy way for transmission, buffet. Uh, Kiazai, what do you think? Uh, about COVID-19? Yeah, do you have a hypothesis? Um, I don't have, but I'm really interested in medicine, how to kill this uh, virus. Okay. Uh, is it possible if another uh, bacteria or virus could uh, kill this virus? <laughs> my, my imagination is like playing sure. in this, like, well, I don't know. So I have, uh, I have some bad news for you. Uh, maybe some of you saw my interview on Ayurang. Yes. Uh, remember I said you cannot kill a virus. So virus is not alive, so there is no magic drug like uh, penicillin for bacteria. So all these viral medicines uh, will slow it down. And there are only two ways you can get rid of the virus. One is to physically destroy it, alcohol, um, soap, etc. And the other one is for the immune system to clear it out. And the antivirals work by slowing it down enough so that your immune system clears it up. So I think that's very important because it's very interesting. I know you have the good, good imagination and for good science and hypothesis, you have to have imagination and you have to have innovation, invention. But also what's very interesting is that you have to uh, also understand certain constraints uh, and reality. And that's a beauty of science and 
and uh, innovation is that it actually works. Not anything's possible, but certain things are possible and how to innovate under those limitations. So we can never kill a virus. Uh, so our hypothesis would be not, you know, how can we have a drug that kills the virus, but how can we have a drug that's safe enough that slows down the virus to almost zero? Or another hypothesis would be, how could we have a method to destroy the virus in the body, like soap and bleach and peroxide, but you can't drink bleach. Don't do it. Okay. You can't, you know, swallow soap, right? Could there be methods of destroying that are not dangerous? That would be kind of imaginative thinking. But anyway, let's go to Bay Sohyon. What would be an example of a hypothesis? Uh, is it possible COVID-19 COVID continues till end of this year, 2020? Okay. Uh, that's not really a hypothesis in a way because you're not, how do you test that? You test that just by doing nothing and waiting, right? So that's more like a prediction. So a hypothesis is a, is a specific uh, um, explanation that you want to test. So one hypothesis could be, uh, is uh, COVID-19 uh, seasonal? So does it change it with the seasons and uh, warm weather, cold weather, et cetera? So that's one way of hypothesis. So hypothesis is not always just a uh, prediction. It has to be something that can be tested. tested. Uh, Mao Wensheng, what is an example of a hypothesis? I have one example of a Mathematics, but I don't know is right or not. Uh, like, uh, if you want to figure out uh, the number of A and B, so you should assume that A is equal to uh, X first, and then you can figure out the what's the number of the A. So when you assume that the A is equal to X, this step is uh, I'm afraid I don't understand. So this is this a COVID-19 hypothesis or a mathematics hypothesis? No, no, it's a mathematics. Ah, okay. So I was asking about the hypothesis about COVID-19. Uh, like, like I said, it's like AX plus B equal 10. You want to uh, figure out the number of A and B. So you should assume that A is equal X, B is equal Y, and then you can figure out the answer. So when you assume that A is equal to B, so this step is phi uh, for this hypothesis. Okay, I will think about it. Uh, <laughs> Shang Jizu Shen, what's a hypothesis? Give an example of a hypothesis related to COVID-19? Um, maybe the, the virus will, will disappear uh, on, at a high temperatures. Okay, high temperatures, yes, you can test that. So that's a good one. Inzu Aitanova, what's an example of a hypothesis related to COVID-19? Inzu Aitanova? Okay, we'll go to uh, Bukhamed Dilai, Dilday. Uh, it is about uh, ginger and the lemon. Someone said that if you will eat ginger with the lemon, it will protect you from the virus. Right. Okay. And uh, now it's like it's, uh, the price for the ginger is like uh, increasing day by day. <laughs> right. So that would be an important hypothesis to test. So again, this is a very short discussion. Uh, there are a lot of details how we test these, but these were good examples. So let's continue. So let's uh, talk about some differences between hypothesis and theory. A hypothesis is a proposed explanation based on some limited evidence. So one of you had mentioned 
or hypothesis is, will the uh, COVID-19 last for the whole year? That's more like a prediction, but what would be the proposed explanation? Why should it go for such a long time? What would be the reasons for that? Again, would it be the seasonality? Would it be the fact that people get uh, uh, impatient and tired of social distancing? They give up or uh, is some other factors involved? So that would be hypotheses. A theory uh, is an idea or a set of ideas intended to explain a set of facts. The hypothesis not scientifically proven yet. The theory is scientifically proven. The hypothesis is typically based on a few data points. So for example, uh, there might be some data that uh, BCG vaccine is uh, protective on uh, uh, severe COVID disease because in Spain where they had, they did not have BCG vaccine, you had high fatalities in Portugal where they did have BCG, it's less and so on and so forth. So then you would test that out and try some trial where some people have BCG vaccine and some uh, do not. And the theory is typically based on a wide range of data. So you have lots of experiments and so forth uh, to validate that hypothesis. And the hypothesis leads to a theory. And the theory, of course, is formulated through proving a hypothesis. So when it comes to science, we also have two types of reasoning, inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning, we start with fact, facts and then come up with a theory. Uh, and deductive reasoning is we have a theory and come up with some uh, facts. So let's look at this in more detail. In inductive reasoning, we have an observation of some facts. We see patterns, we make a hypothesis, and we get a theory. This is the classic scientific medicine, uh, method. Uh, deductive reasoning is we have some theory, we develop a hypothesis, we confirm that. So science actually involves both of these. So for example, you have a theory, you base a hypothesis on a certain part of that theory, find some observations, but those observations are a little bit different than what you expected. And then based on that difference, you say, well, in other words, the pattern is different. You say, I have another hypothesis and you have a new theory. So for example, uh, let's look at uh, how the planets move around the sun. Copernicus theory says that the planets move in a circle. So Tycho Bray does a whole bunch of observations and Johannes Kepler looks at those observations and sees that they are not exactly a circle. He has another hypothesis that they are an ellipse and he confirms based on his equal areas and equal times uh, theory, that they are indeed a ellipse. So the new theory is the planets rotate around the sun in an ellipse. So deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning. So science is often distinguished from art. What is art? Uh, art does not reproduce the visible, rather it makes visible, that's Paul Clay. We all know that art is not truth. Art is a lie that makes us realize truth. And uh, I wrote a, a book, it's called Waves, and it's actually a combination of science and art. So how do I distinguish those two? And in the disclaimer, which is actually the beginning of the book, it's kind of a legal phrase, but I use that legal phrase to describe these two concepts. So this is a work of fiction. As a major portion of the novel is set in the future, uh, these, these uh, future predictions should not be taken as definitive for uh, political or economic decision-making. Uh, no assurances are offered that these uh, forecasts will occur. And then this sentence is very important. All this being said, this book, like all art, is true. In other words, art is a way of expressing through fiction or through depiction 
or through representation some aspect of truth, particularly as it relates to our understanding and appreciation. So art is actually, uh, in a way, uh, trying to uncover this truth. I know that's a very strange concept. But if we look at the, the second or the third paragraph, I talk about clinical matters. This is a scientific treatise, a uh, number of hypotheses, original work cited. Disclaimers aside, this book, like all science, is falsifiable. So in other words, these are the flip sides. Art seeks truth, but cannot be falsified. In other words, one person's art, you can't say that's wrong, that's bad art. You know, Picasso, my book, another artist, whatever, we all have our conception of truth and we try to represent that. We can't falsify it except just by opinion. On the other hand, science is never actually the truth. You know, Newton's laws were very nice but they were replaced by Einstein's relativity. Newton's laws are not the truth, and indeed Einstein's relativity may not be, we know, cannot be the ultimate truth. But science is falsified. So these are the two flip sides. And that's why science and art, in a way, actually go together. And we'll talk about that in the context of uh, Albert Einstein. So Albert Einstein talked about what we uh, view as kind of the, the, the great standard of a scientist. Uh, after a certain high level of technical skill is achieved, science and art tend to coalesce. And the greatest scientists are always artists as well. So that's very uh, important to keep in mind. So another important distinction when we try to understand science is the difference between science and technology. So this is a very famous American uh, policymaker. His name was Vannevar Bush. And he wrote this book uh, right after World War II called Science, the Endless Frontier. It was a report to the president on a program for post-war scientific research by uh, Vannevar Bush. It's a very influential book because it has influenced the whole concept of science and technology, that they are very different. And we need to have basic science and apply technology. Uh, so science and technology are very different. And you said uh, applied science def uh, drives out pure science. Basic research is the pacemaker of technological process. Uh, Another core principle was a separation of basic and applied research, the superiority of uh, basic uh, research. So uh, universities do basic research, companies do uh, uh, technology, government support the universities, universities export that to companies. This whole concept uh, was really very well developed by Vannevar Bush. But the issue is, Science and technology are not totally separate. Uh, and the, we talk about Albert Einstein as a, a kind of pure scientist, but actually he was also a technologist. And if you recall his story, he was, uh, came up with his theories, not as a professor in an academic institution, but actually as a patent clerk in the Bern Patent Office in Switzerland. And he wrote, uh, working on the final formulation of technological patents was a blessing for me. It allowed him many-sided thinking and provided important stimuli to physical thought. So he was reviewing patents and he says it helped him with his physics. That's a little bit strange. So let's try to understand, you know, why that was the case. Why is his exposure to technology so important to his pure basic science. In other words, I'm arguing, my hypothesis is that science and technology are not so separate. So in the early part of the 20th century when Einstein was working, 
there was a very big issue on how to synchronize clocks. They started to have train systems. The Swiss had very good trains, they were on time. Uh, and of course, they developed electricity, uh, was getting quite uh, spread out. The telegraph, communication, they even started having radio communications a little bit after that. But all of this coming together, they said, well, let's actually synchronize the clocks. So uh, many of the patents applications that Einstein received and reviewed and studied, rejected and approved uh, or granted, many of those patent applications concerned synchronizing clocks. So here's an example. This is a burn. And this is the burn patent office down here. Uh, and this is the burn um, Bern uh, clock. And this is the electrical system that was uh, electrical clock network around 1905 in Bern in order to keep these trains synchronized. And so everybody is sending in the applications, how can we synchronize the clocks and everything can be nice. And this is a very applied, practical, technological issue. But Einstein is thinking, uh, what is it, what does it mean to synchronize clocks? And actually that was a mystery to him. So he was not just a technologist, he was not just accepting the uh, patent applications and he wrote the most beautiful experience we have is the mysterious, it is the fundamental emotion that stands at the cradle of two arts and true science. So he's not just saying, let's synchronize the clocks and find out a technological mechanism for that. He's wondering, well, what does it mean? What is the actual uh, process of synchronizing clocks? And so that means that science and technology are very close to each other. Science and art are very close to each other. Uh, and so the definition of science, the core of it, is developing a hypothesis based on facts and uh, being at hypothesis being falsifiable and verifying it against a wider set of facts. But the edges of science also intersect with technology and with art. Uh, let's take a short break here. Uh, 10 minutes, we'll continue at 7.50 with the second half of the lecture. Okay, we'll take a 10 minute break here and uh, start again at 7.50. Okay, we're going to uh, continue. And we're gonna shift a little bit of gears because this is about innovation and culture. And we introduced the scientific method. We'll talk about some examples from business of innovation and culture and two examples that we'll go over very quickly uh, and then we'll review in more detail are 3M. It's a company based in Minnesota and the history of disk drives and disruptive innovation. So 3M, you probably recognize this. Actually, they make a lot of masks for uh, this whole COVID-19 situation. And it was formerly known as the Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing Company. That's why it's 3M. Uh, they don't do any mining and manufacturing anymore. They do uh, all sorts of other products, largely around uh, paper products and adhesive products and sophisticated materials. Uh, so these are adhesives, abrasives, laminates, dental products, electrical materials, electronic circuits, optical films. So it's essentially a material science company. So uh, Richard Drew was uh, an inventor at uh, 3M and uh, he uh, invented masking tape, which is here, cellophane tape and uh, duct tape. So he was quite prolific inventor. 
and he visited an auto repair shop in 1923. And uh, so this is the story of how he made masking tape. It sold, uh, they sold sandpaper. Drew was in the shop to test out the new batch. So this was actually very important. Innovation being connected to the real world, not sitting in you know, some lab just dreaming things. So he went into the uh, shop and they were painting these cars in two colors. And uh, there was a heavy adhesive tape to uh, paint the two colors, but it was coming out really badly. And the adhesive tape peeled away part of the paint job. So this is another example of two colors. So he developed masking tape. It was a tape that had uh, very minimal adhesive properties. So uh, William McKnight was the CEO uh, and he noticed Drew was uh, spending some time on this unofficial project, uh, but he allowed him to create the masking tape. So this was just the start of creating an innovation uh, culture. So they have this 3M way, 15% uh, of employees times allowed on pet projects, just like uh, Richard Drew. Uh, there's a clear tension between innovation and efficiency because innovation usually challenges uh, existing procedures, existing norms. So you do something innovative or different, it slows things down, things get less efficient. So you have to allocate some uh, time for this innovation. So the key lessons from this were uh, importance of engaging with the real world, uh, having free time, uh, allowing uh, people to have their own projects. Uh, those were key learnings. So another example is the post-it note, which is also created by 3M. And so the story of that is also an important story of innovation. So Spencer Silver was a co-creator of the post-it note. He uh, did organic chemistry and was a senior chemist. And Arthur Fry was another co-creator. So he was a product uh, development researcher. So Spencer Silver, the organic chemistry, uh, accidentally developed a very uh, low-tack, reusable pressure sensitive adhesive. So he tried for uh, several years to make this invention throughout uh, 3M but he was unable to find any marketable use. So Arthur Fry, the product development uh, person, attended a seminar and he, uh, he happened to be doing church choir and he was using a book for that church choir. When the book opened, uh, all the bookmarks would uh, fall out. So he wanted to have bookmarks that could be uh, stuck, a, a better bookmark. And if it be co coated on paper, uh, Silver's adhesive would make a good bookmark. So that's where the concept of the post-it note came from. So the takeaways from this, again, are uh, two people coming together, different ideas, different experience, different capabilities coming together to make a uh, use case for a real situation. So here's another example of innovation. We're gonna talk a little bit about uh, disk drives. So this drive, as you know, uh, is a device that's a rotating, has a magnetic surface. There's a read-write head here, and that will pick up uh, magnetic changes uh, in a structured way from that surface. And those magnetic uh, differences are gonna be zeros and ones. And of course, that will be the data that's stored on the disk drive. So most of you are fairly young. You may not be familiar with these uh, rotating disk drives. Uh, it's not that old technology, but that was since the 1950s, uh, some key technology. So the various components to this, there's the, uh, the drive itself, well, the uh, disc itself, excuse me, then a motor that uh, spins it around, then a, uh, a head that uh, actually uh, detects the magnetization and uh, uh, various other electronics that convert that into uh, electrical signals. So we talked about the theory of disruptive innovation. Over time, the product performance increases. You have sustaining technologies and then you have uh, disruptive technologies. And when the disruptive technologies reach a certain point, they will replace the sustaining technologies. So a brief history of disk drives in the 1950s, IBM San Jose Research Labs established these large disk drives, total storage about five megabytes. Uh, and then they developed uh, incrementally, continuously improving. So that would be this 
sustaining technologies, they uh, introduced several improvements, uh, removal packs of rigid disks, the floppy disk drive, another architecture called Winchester architecture, uh, and then several other companies basically also creating disk drives that could plug into the IBM computers. So the key developments were two of them. One was uh, materials, uh, the heads getting smaller and smaller, thin film heads, the magneto resistive heads, and then the architecture from removable disk pack drives to Winchester drives. And they had some other technical developments. So if we look at the read write head, uh, mainly ferrite oxide heads were used, getting more and more precise. Uh, and so they could go up to 30 terabytes per square inch and the growth approximately following an S curve. Uh, the other development of the read write head was the thin films that uh, allowed in 1985, uh, even finer electromagnetic that could be achieved by the ferrite technology. So many firms were moving into this but uh, many of the new firms perished. Uh, in the 1990s, magnetoresistive heads were developed, which accelerated the performance improvement. So again, we're talking about incremental improvements. Uh, and uh, these established firms were beating out these new entrants. And so we got uh, incremental innovations, as we described. So these are these S-curves, ferrite oxide, thin films, and magneto resistive heads. So that's the read write heads. And then we had similar improvements, S curve with removable disk pack drives, Winchester drives in terms of architecture. So all of these uh, innovations are what we call sustaining innovations. So they uh, essentially, uh, the leading practitioners, the leading companies of this technology continue to dominate. The business is not disrupted. Progress happens along historically anticipated lines. So then we started to get disruptive innovations. So disruptive innovations actually were not exactly technological. Uh, the architectural improvements made the uh, drive smaller and smaller, they turned out to be disruptive. So it went from 14 inch to eight inch to five and a quarter inch to three and a half inch, two and a half inch to one and a half. This, especially the transition to three and a half inch ended up being, uh, up to five and a quarter and three and a half inch ended up being disruptive. And this is because the technology itself was remaining effectively the same, but the markets around it were different. There were two markets, basically mainframe mini computer servers, which were 14 inch and above, and the PCs, which were eight inch and below. Two markets. So the market disruption happened not because of technological development, but because of the shift to the eight inch. So they developed uh, these eight inch drives, uh, Shugart, Micropolis, Priam, Quantum. They were not interested, uh, the mainframe manufacturers were not interested in them because they were looking for large capacity. But these disruptive innovations were suited for mini computers produced by DEC, Data General, Prime, and HP. So totally different market. And the market disruption happened because uh, uh, as the market grew for the minis, they actually get, took over from the mainframes. So the mini shipment grew at 25% a year while mainframes were basically constant. So the eight inch show, showed further innovations growing 40% a year. Uh, and these 14 inch manufacturers began to fail. The existing manufacturers began to fail, uh, but they were too behind introducing the eight inch and that's where disruption came. So why the 14 inches, the established players were not uh, displaced by technology uh, because the eight inch was essentially a very similar technology. The reason for the failure was delayed to switch to eight inch because their established markets with the mainframes did not need the uh, eight inch drives. So one reason why I mentioned this example in contrast to the 3M example is that in the 3M example, they were engaged with the customers, 
trying to get input from reality, trying to get input from the market, trying to understand customer needs and the use cases. In this case, listening to current customers is not always good because the current customers were the mainframe customers and uh, those mainframe customers were uh, essentially uh, you know, looking for the large size drives with the large capacity and more expensive. So characteristics of disruptive innovation are worse product performance in the near term. Uh, other attract attractive features that actually only a few customers like, simpler and cheaper. Uh, they actually have lower margins, first commercialized in relatively insignificant markets, and they're not wanted by the leading firm's most profitable and most influential customers. So part of innovation is listening to your market or your users or your customers, and part of innovation is not listening to and looking more at uh, uh, leading edge customers. So here's uh, uh, the disk drive industry just summarized. We had competition based on capacity, competition based on physical size, competition based on reliability, competition based on price and different kinds of disruption over history. So the one we focused on which was the main one was the competition based on physical size. So a closing thought, uh, this is again back to Albert Einstein. Uh, it is a supreme art of a teacher to awaken joy in creative expression and knowledge. And so that's one thing we're trying to do in this class. Uh, I look forward to your uh, uh, answers due on Monday. I sent the assignment and uh, we'll see you next week. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about innovation and culture a little bit more, uh, comparing East and West, comparing Silicon Valley and Israel and Korea and different areas of innovation uh, as they currently exist. So that's what we'll do next week. Uh, we're done for today. Uh, and uh, let me know if you have any questions. Uh, we have obviously have time for questions. Um, and we will resume next, next week.